Hi there, welcome to another episode of the Stellar Sound Podcast, um, the only podcast dedicated to astronauts all the while rocking it in the interdimensional uh, space traveling radars to empower creative musicians. Um, I'm your host, Lucille, and today I'm joined by Anna, or Tulpa, Tusha, and um, first, a uh, reminder to, uh, that you can join us on all our social media platforms at Stellar Sound Podcast. Um, so today I am, um, with a very special artist, uh, who is a Latvia-born, uh, electronic music composer and, well, uh, Tulva, if you want to, um, maybe describe yourself in a few words to the listeners that don't know you maybe Mm -hmm. Uh, hi everybody Uh, thanks for joining the podcast my name is Anna uh, Anna Martinova Uh, my artist names are Tulpa and Dusha so uh, I DJ almost 20 years I play psychedelic trance music dark forest dark progressive I produce music uh, around more than 10 years um, as Dusha and, and the Stulpa I produce minimal techno techno or um, ambience, down tempo chill out, I sing uh, in my compositions and uh, I also opened uh, a project called Modular Moon uh, because my major specialty is also modular synthesizers with uh, which I'm producing music and performing and therefore I'm also uh, am a part of this world of synthesizers and um, I am blessed to be uh, um, founder of the Modro Moon of the school of Aurorec which is located at the moment in multi uh, international uh, level so to say like we have sections in different places of the world so yeah my activity spins around music and music production and the technology around music for what I'm really really thankful and grateful yeah <laughs> that's my life at the moment <laughs> well you have um, created quite a lot of uh, roots and you've um, delved in a lot of um, musical aspects which is very inspiring but I want to also go back to the very beginning of <laughs> maybe your musical career which is your artist name uh, uh-huh. Tulpa Dusha so um, Tulpa uh, is, uh, has quite a like um, spiritual meaning to it and Dusha is uh, actually the Russian word for spirit. So how did you learn these words? Why did you pick them as your artist name? Because they're quite unique. Mm-hmm. Uh, I Like Tulpa kind of came over itself. A friend of mine, Robin, he named me like that. Let's put it this way. Because at the moment, at the times when I was starting like actively produce music and I was thinking, how should I name my project? And it just naturally came out throughout the record session we had in Eindhoven, in his studio. We were just creating a track. And at the time, I wanted to name it somehow natural, like a status, like teleportation or some sort of like mind altering, mind shifting dimension, sound dimension, you know, what a listener could, ex- could experience. <laughs> But it was a bit too long. The name was very long, you know. So a friend of mine, we, were, we started to shorten it up till Telpa, which is in Latvian language means space, just like, you know, space and time. And then somehow during conversation, the Tulpa came across and we started to check. And like the meaning of the word is, uh, is a Tibetan word. So it uh, means the, mani- the process of manifestation of specific mental powers. So, like, I think to interpret that to Western mind, I see it as a birth of an idea and the process of manifestation of it, like whatever it is, like baking a cake, you know, building up a house or having an idea to travel and hike or something. So in my mind, this tulpa process is like this idea to reality kind of concept, which I really like because 
I love to do, to be creative in my life. And so it kind of stick to since then. And that's how it started to be. And the West Dusha is uh, like more for music that I am being related, more like emotional, like if Tulpa would be like night dance, twist, you know, hard and fast uh, times music. I belong to Psytrance, I play Dark Forest. And now there's new tendencies in the form of high tech, which goes like up to 180 BPM, which is very fast music. Like So then there would be this opposite side of my creativity, which is Dusha, which is like ambient and like singing and songs and emotions and all those like, you know, classical kind of stuff. And so, yeah, so I guess I have those both polarities in my artistry which I express and so not to confuse them both they're named differently and yeah Dusha is a very beautiful concept I see like I was born in a family with my my mother being like an active part part of uh, Hare Krishna movement so I grew up with books like Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, you know, uh, Book of Dead, of, of Tibetan, uh, Tibetan Book of Dead. And uh, so, yeah, I was kind of like, throughout this soul concept, I was like raised, basically. That's, I guess, how my mentality is in general. Like, I see and I first address the spirit of things, you know, like, and like native uh, cultures are also very close to me. Shamanic cultures are close to me, to my understanding of the universe. Like I see that everything is alive and, you know, like a soul kind of journey, including myself. So, you know, I, I guess I try to keep myself in that like status of thinking also. Mm. It's really interesting how your name doesn't only have um, an inspiration in your music, but also a philosophy that you live by, you know, that is mm. part of you, your personality. And I think um, it's it's always very touching to see artists uh, being um, very true to themselves, true to who they are in their music, and that's very inspirational. Um, so how, I mean, your um, musical style is... Um, can be uh can vary a lot but you always uh use um modular synthesizers so um mm. well most of the time, uh, most of the time yeah. yeah most of the time and so i mean how did you come to use it uh, when did you first hear one maybe you know mm -hmm. so i started to produce music um uh... I used uh, DOS, digital audio workstations like Logic and Ableton. It's like classical path for every DJ because like most of the DJs at some point they start to produce music and so they start to explore all these fields, you know, technologies. And of course, computer is like major part of our daily routine these days, you know, and like the culture of music production on computers arrived together with the, the computers themselves pretty much, you know. So at the time I was like strongly dwelling on that in my production. And then uh, when the moment came to actually perform it, I didn't want to just like DJ my own music, you know, like also by the major part, most of the time I also produce Dusha stuff, more like orchestral, ambiental music, you know, uh, like for techno part, I usually improvise some modular and it's slightly different form of creating music where you jam and where you are like letting the flow bring you somewhere. Whereas when you are actually construct something on a computer program where you are way more in control and you can always stop and remove some elements if you don't like them, or you can always, you know, cleanse that, like you're in completely different headspace, where it, uh, relatively to modular, full improvisation and like composition on the fly, you know? Um, yeah, so while producing music, I started to ask myself, how do I actually perform it? And then the Moog Mother 22 came across. Actually, uh, there is a artist, Erica, 
And at the time they released, just, they just released Mother 32. And I saw this video called Solar Rise uh, that she did improvisation on two systems, two Mother, Mother 32s. And I was completely in love with all the sounding and with all the, you know, all the spectrum and all the power of this, those machines, you know. And that was my first encounter. So I saw the device, I heard the, the actual composition of the person. I was like re-listening it every daily, you know, until I got myself one. You know? <laughs> so I, that's how I started the fuss. And then I started to actually learn the whole technology and sort of like band it. Like the more I learn it, the more I see what I can do with it. You know, and also, of course, the teaching by side is also like a great motivator because you also learn while you teach as well, you know. So, yeah, so it was like a natural kind of progress uh, throughout time. And, yeah, I'm really glad I'm a part of that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, you've talked about um, how it can be an advantage to your music, being able to control the sounds. But um, what do you think it brings to your music? Is there like a particular um, sound or aspect that you think is quite unique for your music? Absolutely. Like every like modular synthesizer, it allows you to configure the system under your own vision, you know, because you're working with all those building blocks that you communicate yourself each block to each other with the patching cables. So that opens a vast variety of patches of uh, ways for the signal flow. You know, you can out of one voice and one multiplicator and couple, one multiplier and audio buffered multiplier and couple of effects, you can create soundscapes uh, in a variety of ways, you know, and just few modules can bring you so far and can open up so many soundscapes to you, you know. So of course, modular synthesizer is extremely beneficial machine. Also because it, it allows you to reflect your own vision, you know, like to, uh, let's say, if I'm targeting psychedelic trance music, then the elements of this music will be particular because that's this style demands some sounds, you know, it, it's like some specific formula that you follow. And in that sense, the Aurora Act is so flexible, you know, it can bring you to psychedelic, it can bring you to, let's say, normal human music, you know, even pop music, even just uh, orchestral, even drones, or like, it all sort of like depends on you as an artist, where, which way you want to pursue. And yeah, that's why, yeah, the answer is, it's very, very beneficial yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so you really try to make it cater to your needs your style what you um need which is um very impressive but what's also very impressive that you do is you actually perform live with your modular synthesizer which um i heard is a uh, quite a challenge how did you get to that point <laughs> By practicing a lot, of course, and uh, challenging myself, and also all the time being not completely satisfied from what, from everything what I was hearing from myself before, you know. So every time, just reflecting back and then learning on my own mistakes, you know, or let's say, okay, this sound I didn't really like, this voice I don't really like, you know, like being absolutely critical towards your own creation, like towards your own self like you know and then all the time uh, learning from mistakes making a line you know and okay this is was this part of performance this particular module is perfect those not really because there is a big difference between actually manufacturing a product and actually perform on it and a lot of times the manufacturers they are great physicists, they are great electronic engineers, they are great minds, but they don't have the actual performance experience. 
and therefore my expertise, my um, experience comes into hand also, where I can reflect sometimes some buttons even or slides or the entire workings. It's like a tool, you know. Imagine yourself as a sculptorist and or a painter. And what we do, we draw with sounds, so to say, through space and time, you know. So music is like organizing sounds in space and time in specific artistic form. So uh, it's not necessarily something which you can touch. Like, let's say, if you have a painting and you draw, you can touch the paint, you know, you can. Fr it's frozen in the moment of time. With the sound, if the sound came out, you cannot, like, erase it or you cannot return it back you know you either have to accept it if you didn't really like it how it went out or and you know analyze yourself and then self-reflect and then let's say okay this part was great here i was a little bit hurrying in the mix here i was a little bit lazy you know like it's a constant work on your own character actually and a lot of psychological work as well because like many people also struggle with overcoming themselves even to sing like even relatively singing i was also quite shy for even only last two years ago i started to reveal my voice way more often and sing and have some videos on instagram you know like even that was like a psychological block to go through you know, so of course, relatively the technology is also like challenging big time and it takes time and practice and effort, of course, like anything in this world, pretty much, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I think most uh, artic artistic fields, what they often find is uh, it can be very hard to have to self reflect, to be critical of your work can really impact you as a person I think but it also is what makes you a not just a good musician but a great musician it's being able to improve yourself based on uh, what what you think of your own music which is quite um I think impressive and very uh, I think a lot of people can relate to what you're saying and um so you talk about um, being uh, reflective of your own music, which is, um, I mean, have you started music when you were younger? Was it like something that you've always done to be able to think that way? Because, um, well, I think there's um, quite some maturity to thinking that way about your music. So I'm wondering if... Uh, how was music a part of your life growing up, basically? Well, uh, you know, I was born in Soviet Union, actually. <laughs> I was born in 1982 in a musician's family. My father is a multi-instrumentalist and a conductor. And, you know, my father and my mother, they had four kids. And all kids in the family were going to musical school. My mother is a singer also was a singer and so I was in this environment already and since my father was a part of Russian army he was like a conductor they would usually have like a marching orchestras so he was working all his life in army basically so my family has this um, army um, history uh, my grandfather would fight in Second World War, both of them, you know, like uh, one of them passed away and died uh, uh, by the end of Second World War, you know, and stuff like this. So, and since I was born in a family like that, every child and also Soviet Union, maybe you know something about it. Like these days, it's all about like trashing the communism, whatever, you know, but people are like not, they are like neglecting the like the, the normal life people had. So, for example, like it was very common to target your child to almost become like a Yuri Gagarin or like a super advanced engineer or like scientific, like science was very strongly, very, very um, pushed forward in Soviet Union and uh, like personal development in general, you know. So kids were stimulated from early age to grow to learn, to discover, you know, to to work for the community, to bring benefits to the society in general. Like the whole mentality was like shaped in that 
direction, you know, collective sort of efforts. So I guess I observed that as well, because I mean, I was born in the country as such. I was born in Soviet Latvia in 1982, although I was already growing through the fail of the Soviet states and all this political change that was, of course, dramatically uh, influencing my life and life of my family. You know, my father had to come back to Russia. We were forbidden to see each other. I was, as a Russian person, I was, you know, horribly, there was uh, nationalistic uh, uh, anti-Russian movements. You know, we were brainwashed to hate our own country like some kind of strange games on the background between NATO and whatever was reflected through my life, you know? So that was influencing also if I could study music because when Soviet Union fell into parts, all schools that Soviets developed, everything they invested into the Baltics were broken, stolen off. Like all the factories that the Soviets were building for Baltics, they were stalling off and <laughs> sold off as scrap. You know, musical schools were completely destroyed. You know, all the professionals, all the people, all the intellectuals had to come back to Russia. The country was completely destroyed. And uh, by gaining independence, it felt like it was worth it. But now in the long run, the country is completely destroyed. And uh, like, uh, I moved out from my home country uh, by the age of 25 and I think 50% of population did as well so that was strongly influencing my musical education because I just literally didn't even have places to study because the politics was wrecking the country big time and no one like people like to talk about all those big things you know but no one really talks what it is when it comes down to individual families, how many families were broken, how many people lost work, how many people lost lives, you know, many people lost everything, you know, with, with repercussions throughout over the years, you know, and no one really talks about that. But I lived through that, you know, and I still keep on living through this as a Russian person as well, you know, also these days, especially, you know, all those repercussions from blaming Soviets, whatnot, whatever they are all the time upset about, you know. And I mean, I can be thankful because I, I managed to pull the best what I saw, you know, relatively even system I developed to learn modular. I completely took Soviet system, you know, the Soviet system of education reflected that on the sound synthesis and that's how I created the school. You know, this is how I created the method. This is how we work at the moment, you know? So I don't have any, like, I'm open-minded person. Like, okay, yeah, there was this part of history that was, it was what it was. I live right now. I must take the best out of what happened to me and bring it crystallized into the future. If it's useful for someone, it's useful for me, first of all. You know, so in my case, yeah, it was this complex reflection all the time. So I actually had only four years of piano classes, which was still during Soviet times, because uh, in Soviet Union, as a six years old child, six, seven years old, you enter the musical school and you study there all life, parallel with your own normal school. So you study there. 12 years and then you go to higher musical education, you know, like institution and university. So it's really, really strong and advanced system. Unfortunately, I could only grab four years out of that because then the Soviet Union fell into parts. Yeah, and all those systems, they were destroyed, which is a tragedy, you know, because it's a very, very unique and very strong educational systems. 80 years of education, you know, like, I don't know what, like Soviet Union, it was a monarchy before and there was no education at all. So Soviets over 80 years, they made sure that everyone has available education for free, any education you want in a very high advanced level, you know? So that's why there is all the space technology and all this like very advanced stuff, you know? So I come from that world and this part is, was very strong and unique. And I think, I hope we will somehow revive like I mean there is a lot of systems right now that are used and copied and whatever but yeah so 
I could accomplish my musical education. Even that is not complete. It's just a music production course at SIE, which was six months long here in Amsterdam when I was already like living here. And uh, I was pregnant at the time with my son and I was, you know, working at the same time and studying at the same time. So I cannot say like that I have any academic education, like, or any accomplished, you know, very strong school of, I don't know, classical music or what a lot of my friends have. I don't have any of that, but my parents, my father, he's all his life is music and I'm a late child. And I guess I absorbed a lot from his experience, you know, from his luckily, because politically I was, uh, I had to go through many things like, you know, that's part of life and many countries go through all kinds of things. So yeah, in my case, it's, I guess I accomplished it for myself throughout actually like meeting people like Pete Johnston also, you know, like ga- gaining the Kima Pakarana system for myself, like unique environment for sound synthesis, which also brought me further. There is no, no uh, like complex education on that field so far, like not so many places or those places, like at least until mo- before the Mojo Moon, they were extremely exclusive and expensive, you know to gain into the synthesis field. It was always like a luxurious and always, uh, you know, exclusive f- format. Where, what was also for me like a mission, you know, to make it available for people, you know, mm-hmm. because there's so many talents out there. Also growing talents, growing uh, generations, you know, who who needs that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, that's quite a story about, well, how it, how it um, affected you. And, well, I know that there's a lot of um, hard times, I guess, with um, education and so on, but it's actually, it makes it more impressive that you managed to uh, build your musical career and and learn modular synthesizers because well uh, again that's quite a complex field to learn yeah. um, but so do you think um, for anyone who wants to pursue music but also uh, can't really get a musical education do you think there's any benefits or any uh, tips any anything that you want to express to them Absolutely, like, just don't give up and just, you know, study and study yourself also, you know, study from every source you can find, you know, and like, yeah, some people are lucky they can enter academy and have their paper, but it doesn't mean they're going to be great also, you know, a lot of people go to academies just for paper or because their parents told them so or whatnot, you know, like people have all kinds of motivations. And, uh, it's, it doesn't, it can help you, but it doesn't define anything. What, what, who is the only person who can define anything whatsoever in your life? It's you only, you yourself only, you know, and this universe is, you know, merciful. And of course it will challenge you and test you in all kinds of ways, you know, but if you go through that and you really love what you're doing and love music and there's, there shouldn't be anything to stop you, just don't harm anyone along the way. Try to make like a pure karma, you know, kind yeah. of. And that's, that's probably the only something, like the only rule I could say, you know, just be humble and be, be pure and kind, I guess, you know. But these days we have YouTube, we have like so many also free educational sources these days, you know, so actually like uh, even with my school, I like a person can just buy a book and study themselves, you know, and everything is layered out very simply. Like, so, you know, these days so many things are available for people. 
So yeah, there shouldn't be any blockages at all, you know, with these days. Mm. Yeah. yeah. We see also um social media it allows also a lot of people to be able to share content which uh, wasn't which they weren't able to before at this level at this um global and international level which is very um impressive so many people have built themselves off um being able to share and um so i i want to also go back to uh modular moon which you have been um mentioning mm-hmm. uh so you founded uh a synthesis school called yeah. uh, modular moon but do you want to i mean you explained a bit um some of the aims of that school but do you want to maybe uh reintroduce uh what modular moon is um what it is what's the what's the goal what's the end goal and why did you create the school uh yeah so yeah the modular moon is like um uh, my child my second child <laughs> So first child is Tristan of course <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then Mojo one or third child like yeah anyway so yeah it's just naturally like came up so the moment i met the modular synthesis like in general like the first time i saw like complete wall with machines with modules that was in Latvia in the Erika Synth company I went there to play a DJ set at the festival and somebody told me, hey, you should check out this company and visit them. So I went there, I saw the entire wall full of modules and that was the moment I knew that this is my path, you know, like I had this like over 10 years, I didn't have this strong internal feeling that yes, that's the path, that's what I must be, that's what I must do, that's something mine, you know. So I started to kind of explore what was that all about, what is my passion all about. And I ordered like plain PCBs to solder. Because at first, of course, you see all those modules, you think, oh my God, it's so expensive. How will I ever build like one module might be up to 200 euro. Like, so you start to sort of uh, like search ways how to afford that. So at first I did like common mistake. I bought like... 10 plain PCBs without any uh, components. So if you know for PCBs, for people who solder modules, so you need to have resistors, transistors, uh, like all kind of components that go inside this PCB. And whenever you're buying plain PCB without anything, you receive like a ball, like a list of components you have to also order. And usually they come in one big bag all together, you know? And like for a person who is like far away from electronics or any of that, <laughs> you know, it's an interesting uh, It must puzzle. have been uh, intimidating. <laughs> it was challenging big time, you know? So, and then uh, kind of like I thought, okay, like, well, let's see how it works. So I started to explore that. I realized that there's those lists you order and then they bring you components and then you find the right... Uh, measurement for specific component and you sold it in and etc so i was like busy with that for like a few quite a amount of nights and at some point there was a thought in my head like that's so confusing that's like there must be a school about this like a school about modulars and that's where it came you know like the idea of like to actually build the school to actually make it like structurized knowledge you know, and like to give out, to layer out to people throughout a specific amount of time. At some point, it started to transform into the school. And it started to sort of like have its own natural path. Like some people would come up and just bring me gear, you know, for two years, just giving, just loaning it for two years. You know, like some people would pump up who would bring this, this idea further, like, Robin from Molten Modular, like I was at the time also trying Kickstarter and I put this idea like out there, which is a tricky point also. And then he saw this and he made an article and uh, like for the some synthesizer community, like, hey, the school idea, that could be cool. And so he accelerated that also big time because mm. suddenly some people started to come up and say, hey, you're this girl with this cool idea. Like, what's up mm. with that? Like, 
let's do this, you know? And then this A-Lab place I found, like, because I was already, like, actively doing steps, like, finding the, the location, you know, testing the promotion, like, starting to spread the word and, like, etc. And so it started to layer out naturally. Uh, some people were even, borrow, like, donating modules, like I would say in my Facebook profile as if for like 5,000 friends I have in there from DJing times, you know, like, hey, yeah. this is a good idea. Like, do you guys want to have it or not? Like, I, I can do it. Just, you know, I need some mm. help. You know, and some people would just donate me like a sequencer or like a friends would come over, visit us and I'd say, okay, like if you were like targeting my couch, like then buy me one for also later, you know, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I was like trading my possibilities to like actual physical modules you know like because i didn't want to have like any uh credit or mm -hmm. any loan like i thought if if the universe wants this idea it will happen i just have to relax and do my best you know mm -hmm. like and and activate my creativity like and since i had like all this background in graphic and like digital graphics you know so i could do all the all these artworks and websites and yeah. you know, spreading the word and of course the fact that i was already having something on the table and patching and showing off that you know to through social networks like hey check this out check this patch mm -hmm. check this you know every day in the beginning i was like bombarding like you know social networks with uh, patches like daily you know now now it's way less actually you know but yeah. in the beginning yeah in the beginning you still put, um... Sorry, it must have been um, quite motivational to receive support through time, you know, like it mm. it keeps you going. And um, well, now, now you're international, you have different um, bases around the world, which is very impressive. Um, yeah. Can you explain where you opened the first one and where is the most recent one that was opened? So the first, uh, the nest is in Amsterdam, of course, at the lab. So that's where the headquarters started and where we did all the testings, uh, where we lived through COVID times, you know, every day I just had adaptation, you know, for COVID rules, whatnot. We survived COVID, uh, you know, actually I wrote a book during 2020 and like the entire year was spent to write the book. I guess without it, like, I wouldn't also slow down, you know, and wouldn't have, like, a year to actually, like, write the book. But the book was already in prototype, in projection, even before before COVID, during the, the actual year of, like, building up the company with the eigenwerk. I was already, like, writing down the business planning, and I knew already we will have to have a book, we will have to have, you know, classes shaped, into a program we would have to have this and that you know so the planning of course starts way way earlier and then it sort of starts to happen and you kind of follow the moment and if you see it, it's happening you, you feel it like okay now it's the time to write the book and we are we're, we're really dedicated and you know writing it every day having a phone call you know describing a chapter going back to school, testing the chapter on people, asking their feedback, okay, what is clear, what is not clear, where should we add information, where was a little bit too much or too confusing, ex explained too difficult, you know. So that was like two years of actually like, you know, going through all those layers of work because the book is like the major aspect because it's like crystallized program from where everything sort of spins, you know, mm. like every uh, school has, every section uh, as of now has access to this method. And it's really, it works very well, this method, you know, because like it's layer out, layered out simply step by step. And also there is a lot of con very specific steps, you know, where from to, to start to end point, so to say, you know, and that's exact necessary amount a person needs you know to build up their own journey on that already so yeah so first year amsterdam times was of course a lot of 
every person who ever started up the business they know how it is in the beginning you know and you do everything everything you you know you you vacuum clean the house you you wash the dishes after your students are away you know you are fully providing the whole the whole system you know at the beginning especially you know and yeah you have to be quite open to things you have to do to make the business run and working on weekends working on new years working on christmas working 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 like especially at the start you li- really accelerate and then at some point uh, we had the student from mexico andres actually he came over right before covid started and he kind of got stuck here in the netherlands yeah. and since he was here i asked him to translate the book to spanish language because he had nothing to do anyway you know <laughs> he was stuck we were all stuck and so he translated the book and he came back to mexico and i told him okay like open the module moon mexico like uh, like that would be very i was convincing him and at the beginning he was it's very classical so reaction like at times young artists they're a bit afraid they think if they will start to teach that then they will not actually grow as an artist so mm. they are a bit afraid to to trade that and actually it's literally one thing the moment you start to teach the moment you start to give you start to grow as an artist as well like because you meet people they bring you somewhere they open some news to you some doors and mm. so to give away it's always better than to like grasp something and milk it your whole life, you know? <laughs> like I realized that through time, like every new thing I discover, I give it to students and then I noticed, okay, then there's a new thing coming up, new and new opening, new, uh, you know, discovery in the sound synthesis field. So he kind of like understood that and he went back and he opened the Mojo Moon Mexico with the Sala del Audio, which is like uh, Institute of Mexico, like something like SIE, only in Mexico. And mm. for some time they worked uh, in collaboration with them until he was ready to move on and work independently in their own studio. They created their own studio in there. Actually, I haven't seen that in physical yet. So I'm going there this May. I'm flying to Mexico for three weeks, and this is when I'm gonna be able to see it first in physical. <laughs> Actually, so but they already are quite far. They did great job, and like they educated also because of COVID. They had like online classes with like 40 people on board, like extremely big amount of students. And one of those students was because it was online was also a person from Chile. Valdo. So he was a student of Andres, actually. So, and then Valdo came in Chile, we started to communicate, and at some point he's like, I would like, let's open Mojo Moon Santiago. So, and he started to work on that direction, you know? So it's like, like Matryoshka kind of grows itself, you know? And I'm fully open for that, you know? Then uh, Atakin joined in at some point. And then he came back to Japan. I said, like, you can, if you would like to, you can give classes as part of Mojo Moon. Of course, in Japan, it's slightly different configuration, more like private classes. And because uh, it's every different country has different expectations, different settings, different style of workings. And recently we also opened Goa. So that was also a big milestone, you know, so I just, went there i just came back from there like two weeks ago and so i was training people there first batch of students for one month a bit more than one month we were working like four days a week like actual classes you know and now there's also one in goa india so you know yeah and i'm really happy about it (laughs) well congratulations first of all for the new (laughs) opening and i mean I can't imagine how it feels to have an idea and then it grows and it grows and people are supporting it and they go behind it and they're motivated by it. It must have, I I can't imagine how it could possibly feel. It must have been very, I mean, I think I would feel very uh, fulfilled by that. Um, How did it, I mean, how did you feel seeing so many of your students be motivated and passionate to keep this growing? Oh, it's, I guess that's very, um, how to say, rewarding feeling, you know, when you see that people are 
actually happy, you know, and sometimes it's just one beautiful patch and you see a person glowing, you know, and that's mm. a very beautiful feeling, of course. And there is, um, there is a uh, one, um, collaboration that I did, uh, notice, uh, that you did was actually during your Dusha album of Rebirth, you you attached some art um, by Peter Grick, and I found it so. Um, there's something quite um, euphoric. I don't. It's, it was so amazing to see uh, such beautiful art and how it related to your music. I was very 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 amazed and very impressed um and i just um i wanted to know maybe how did you come to collaborate with him what was who initiated contact what was the idea behind it because it was it was it was something <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah actually through social media somehow like uh peter um we were communicating at the time and I was always a big fan of his artworks. And at the time I wasn't really producing music much, actually. I was more like DJing and I was always like, I'm a bit like a supporter of art in general. Like I draw myself a bit, but I kind of like stopped doing that. But I love art in all shapes and forms. And at times I'm like, uh, buy, I buy art sometimes, you know, like from my favorite artists, like... So I was, of course, I knew about him already before. And at some point I saw a dream, actually. I saw one of his paintings in a dream. He has this, uh, like a field, like a drawing of a field and an object in it, uh, like a, um, something like a vortex in the ground. And I was standing around that vortex in my dream, you know? And I, I was fascinated from that dream. Like, I mean, I see dreams my whole life. That's like one of the part of my being also like, and challenge of my being also. But yeah, I, I saw that in a dream and I sent him a message like, wow, Peter, can you imagine? I saw your artwork in a dream and a number nine, number nine and the number nine. I don't know what it was meaning. And he responded somehow. He's just like, wow, it's interesting. You saw my art in a dream. And this number, there was some kind of a meaning behind this number for him also. I already don't remember details, but we started the conversation and that's how we were like, since then we started to communicate about art, like through social media, actually. So that was like years ago. And we started to have like communication and exchange of artworks and kind of friends. We became friends somehow naturally. And with time I started to produce music and then I uh, wrote this album uh, too that I released with uh, Ovni Moon Records uh, at first. So I was thinking about the, the album cover and somehow it came up when I, I sent the album to Peter and I asked him like, maybe I can, maybe you can like support me in this, like, would you like this? Mm -hmm. And he loved it, and he sent me this Orbiter artwork, and he was completely up for it to support my musical journey. And then he did also those sh short videos on, he on his artworks, and I would send him some music for that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we started to exchange, uh, like I would give him some music and he would give me some artworks. And since then, it kind of like continues up until and growing and like it grew until like all this 80 minute uh, journey that he created. And I, the, the album, this, the, the rebirth is all about that. Actually, we still didn't release the actual video with audio, the original ones. I performed that in Italy, but like to release it, it's entire new story we have to go through. And because I'm traveling at the moment a lot and like opening, working on schools opening. So at the moment I can't focus on releasing the actual physical album, but it is still in the making. Like, I mean, the album is there. We just need to actually physically print it and like organize mm. all the promotion and all that. But yeah, like uh, we are friends and very good friends, you know, and like 
I visited him in Austria also uh, with Kristen who were there, you know, and there was other artists there also. And we were like having very nice time in Austria. Like uh, Peter was showing where he's living. We were going to swim on the river and, you know, all the artworks and like, yeah, he's a beautiful soul, you know, and a very good mm. friend of mine. And I'm very, very lucky to have him in, in my family, basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, those, I feel like those artworks and, and your music, they really managed to sing, uh, sync together in a way. Mm-hmm. And it's, and it was, um, yeah, as you've mentioned, for me, seeing that for the first time, it's quite dreamlike, you know, uh, his art style as well is quite, um, dreamlike and so you had um inspiration obviously through time and um i also wanted to ask about uh, maybe inspiration that comes in music videos uh, because you do have some music video productions where where does the inspiration come from and also how hard is it to bring your song which is um, audio into a visual presentation of what you're saying, what your ideas basically. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's always a moment, I guess, and also some specific, some sort of impulsiveness is also in it. And like at times, it's just something I go through emotionally, and then it just starts to sort of ask itself to go out. <laughs> you know, and I'm just challenged myself and I it's some part of me like disattaches from everything, you know, from any potential shame and feeling, you know, <laughs> and embarrassment and whatever like that comes together with that. Like I believe artists they break through their their psychological barriers every time, you know, or like of course it's there, like even stage even pre-performance and anxiety like it's every time there you know like even if you already like perform I mean they have quite significant amount of hours you know spent on this on the stage you always still have all the performance anxiety and of course music videos they are of course they reflect the, the actual idea and the actual feeling that I try to express and I would love to make more music videos and I would love to work with proper team and I would love to reveal my vision in greater detail or for instance, uh, also um, sometimes you sometimes you re- record uh, composition and there is some kind of like a vision, like an idea going through mind and you want to actually express it, so to say, into the vision, into actual story, into the actual movie. Not always you have all the technical aspects, you know, to actually show the precision, the idea. But I try to bring it as close of, as possible and, of course, uh, follow the moment and just there and, you know, yeah. So just mm. there and also I guess the fact that like I realized that we're all gonna die eventually <laughs> like it's such a weird motivation I guess but, you know like do you think like we're but we're dust anyway like I mean come on like in 250 years <laughs> you know maybe you maybe someone will remember if you like you know we remember Bach and Mozart you know, but maybe somebody will remember Tulpa, hopefully, maybe not, you know, but I mean, it liberates you to a certain degree, even if you are like, okay, maybe if they won't get my idea, at least I, you know, I had fun. And mm. So I, I kind of like grow, go from that aspect that, yeah, maybe for some people, some people probably will hate that. Some people will judge me. Some people, you know, like there is all, all those spectrum of reflection of uh, um, 
reactions you know other people will love it other people will steal a part of this song and remix it other people will and maybe will never tell me you know and other people will compliment me and etc etc and that's you know uh, natural also i natural reactions and you know i enjoy that i enjoy i enjoy what i do and even that is also kind of a, a mental state where you need to bring yourself to as an artist because there is a lot of pains in arts you know and sometimes it hurts and sometimes you feel weird and you don't understand why until you actually write something and then you feel like relieved you know so there's all this like aspects of mysterious aspects that artist struggles yeah they are real i have them too you know so yeah of course it's struggling and having fun at the same time voice <laughs> <laughs> like that yeah i yeah. definitely understand that and um well uh sadly we are reaching towards the end of uh the interview but uh before um i would like to move on to a segment called uh behold the meteor shower <laughs> in which uh i will be asking um a set of rapid fire questions and uh you will be answering the first thing that comes to your mind the the first answer that you have all right okay yeah. are you are you ready to start yeah <laughs> okay um first question if you could be a module which one would you be uh, an oscillator okay <laughs> <laughs> Um what was your favorite childhood dish? Baked potatoes. Ooh. Good <laughs> answer. <laughs> um what was the first job you ever wanted to do? Wanted or had to do? Wanted. <laughs> wanted. I never wanted any job to be honest. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> <laughs> I had to. Yeah. Um well, who was your first music icon growing up? Bjork. Okay. Bjork, yeah. Interesting. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> um which movie according to you has the best soundtrack? The best soundtrack is uh, Twin Peaks. Okay. Yeah, uh, Twin Peaks. Interesting. I'll give that a listen later oh. on. <laughs> Um what uh musical artist should we all be listening to right now? Right this right now. Hmm. Um HQ. Okay. HQ. Yeah. It's a nice And... artist from UK. Okay. Yeah. And lastly, um and most importantly, what was the best musical advice you have ever gotten? from my father to be clear in compositions in the thoughts like the idea of composition must be very clear and precise and that's mm-hmm. the best advice i had yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice. like that. i mean it it must be a it's it's nice that well as you mentioned your dad was uh, so important for your musical journey so Mm-hmm. Um listening to uh advice from people that shape your music that's always so I think personal as well and that's very that's very nice sorry um so uh I also wanted to ask um before uh the podcast ends what does the future look like for you what are maybe uh projects that we could all be looking forward to at the moment uh opening schools in mm-hmm. multiple dimensions and performing more playing music traveling definitely yeah at this moment yeah i do this and next what we want to do is the game that we already like trying to toggle this area and mm-hmm. we want to create a um, based on a book we want to create an educative computer game or an app 
for modular and more like entertaining kind of field and we also want to go more into entertainment field also as a school in general so yesterday we were talking about this also with one of my colleagues for now i will keep it uh, mysterious but mm -hmm. so we want to go more into the actual you know live living entertaining performing teaching things like this yeah well i think um we all can't wait to see what uh, happens next for you in uh, your journey that you can share with us. Um, so yeah. thank you so much for being here uh, today at the podcast. It was so nice getting to talk to you, get more, get to know more about uh, you and your musical style, which is uh, so unique and so um, in inspirational, I think, for a lot of people. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you for your uh, For well, all of the listeners, um, well, we hope to, we thank you for listening and uh, we hope to see you at um, the next episode. Mm -hmm.